Morning, Rev City. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> Woo! Good stuff. You guys are ready. Hey, if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. We're going to get there in a minute. Uh, hey, my name is Micah Barclay. I'm one of the pastors here. I have the privilege of getting to share the Word of God with you guys, and I am very excited because right now, we are in our sermon series, Culture of Revival. And who's been enjoying this sermon series so far? Come on, come on, it's been awesome. It's been so, so good. I encourage you guys, if you have not had a chance to listen to all of Pastor Thomas's messages on this, go back and do so. They have been so good, so equipping and encouraging and strengthening. Um, he's been talking about how to have a heart for revival, the passion, oh, I'll be talking about the passion of revival. He's been talking about how to, how, how to speak revival. And today, I wanna to talk to you guys about how to have a passion for revival because we should be passionate about this, right? This should be something that we should get excited about every time we get to church. But it begs the question, and he's been answering it, what really is revival, right? Because we have all these thoughts and definitions and ideas of what revival is. And maybe your idea of revival is getting a big tent, having a special preacher come, having a special band in that drum. You know, it's, it's going that boom ka boom ka, and you're like, oh, that's the spirit right there. I love that. But is that really revival? We have to ask ourselves that question. And, and maybe that's how I experienced revival. And I think it kind of was. We used to go to these things called camp meetings. Anyone want to go to a camp meeting before? Okay, so a few hands. And uh, that was like what I thought revival was. But Pastor Thomas has been encouraging us and giving us some maybe different definitions, letting us think about it a little bit differently. And here's two definitions that we've been looking at. First one is this. It's an improvement in the conditioning or strength of something. Another definition. It's an instance of something becoming popular, relevant, active, or important again. And when I heard that definition, the first thing that really came to my mind was the Jesus movement movement of the 1960s and 70s. So just for fun, who in here was a part of the Jesus movement of the 60s and 70s? Raise them real high. All right, give them a round of applause right here, guys. Maybe you don't know much about the Jesus movement. That's okay, I'll tell you a little bit. I really think we've had lots of moves of God since then. Don't get me wrong, I know we have. But I think that was our last great national revival in this nation. And it was brought by these hippies. Sorry, guys, that's what you guys were. You were all hippies. It's all right. We got, you know. And, but it was brought on by these hippies that were maybe largely rejected from the world because they loved God. But they were also largely rejected from the church, the Big C Church, because because they love God and they had a different expression of worship, maybe a different expression of love than, than that what it was used to, right? And if you guys did not know this, this church was actually conceived in the Jesus movement in the 60s. And so just for fun, I have this picture I'd love to throw up on the screen if you guys still have it, and we'll look at it together. So these are our founding fathers and mothers, so to speak. We can give thanks today that we are here right now worshiping because of these people. And I just wanna point out a few of these pictures. That main picture right in the middle, you can see the couple that's on the far right side. That's Pastor Peter and Alice Willems. Come on, let's give it up for them. Pastor Peter was our lead senior pastor for many, many, many years here. Now he serves as a pastor of pastoral care, does an unbelievable job. And then at the top right corner, the black and white picture, that's Walt and Ann Keem. They run an international connections ministry for international students up at KU. And I'm sure there's many, many others. I don't even recognize quite all of them, but here's two things to know to be sure. Well, and I love that sign. If I read it right, it says, the sooner you know Jesus, the better. And if, who knows if that was true then, it's probably true today too, right? But when I look at this picture, I see two things. One, I see a group of people that, are, like, look at their smiles. Don't they just show, like, genuine love for each other and what they're doing right there in that moment? I see people that are truly loving, and I also see checkered pants. So I'm going to wear checkered pants next time I preach, because I'm sure if I did that, I could probably bring revival. So you never know, Okay. But I want you guys to catch this, okay? This is an important part of our nation's history because I really believe this was an instance of something being a popular, relevant, active, or important again in this nation. It was a strengthening of something because I really believe when the heart of a nation grows cold, 
In many ways, God raises up people to make a difference in that nation. And I think that our nation was at a tipping point. I mean, we had the Vietnam War, all these things going on. And then he was like, I need people to stand up. And they stood up. Can I tell you today, our nation is thriving and we need to stand up for Jesus. We need to be the people who love and express that love in maybe a different way, but still a godly biblical way and make a difference in this nation again. So today, I wanna talk to you and give you a story of a, a man who brought a nation revival. And that was King David when he brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And I'm sure you're familiar with this story, you've probably read it before, but I think there's a few things that we can pull from this story that's maybe like, hey, here's some things that David did pretty good. I also think there's a few things that we can pull from this story that goes, ooh, David might've missed the mark on this one. We could maybe change it. We could do a little bit better than what David did. Either the case, I believe God wanted that nation, the nation of Israel, to experience freedom like they were not experiencing. And I believe more today than ever that God wants to us in this nation right now, the United States of America, to experience freedom and revival that we are not currently experiencing. And about, I believe it really does start with you and it starts with me. So would you just bow your heads one more time? We're gonna pray, we're gonna dive into God's word. Let's just turn our hearts to the Lord. Father. We thank you for this time. Truly, we are so grateful that we get to live in this nation, a nation that we get to freely meet together. We understand many places around the world can't even do that, and we lift up those brothers and sisters. But right here, right now, we plead for this nation, our home, and I ask that a revival would break out again. More than just a, a good song, more than good preaching, more than any of those things, that your love would shine so bright in this nation that we see hearts and life change, marriages restored, stored and healed God. We believe that this can only happen through your spirit. So Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place. Come speak to us. We love you, God. We give you this time. We pray that you would mold us and shape us into the image of your son. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen, amen. All right, so we're gonna get to... Uh, First Chronicles chapter 13 here in a minute, but I wanna set the stage uh, so we kinda understand what's going on in Israel's history, right? So David is very new to his kingship. He just became king over all Israel. But notice how I say he's new to his kingship. He is not new to leadership. David has been a leader for a long time. He was leading his father's sheep as a boy, right? And if we know the story, then he goes and works for King Saul. And he gets promoted in leadership there and people start following him. Then he goes into the King Saul's army and what happens? People start following him and he becomes higher and higher and, and greater responsibility. Eventually he leaves King Saul. What happens? People follow him. He's a leader, right? You wanna know a good way if you're leading? Is anyone following you? And so people keep following everywhere he goes and eventually he becomes king over the tribe of Judah, one. And it's not until after Saul's death that finally he becomes king over all of Israel. And he has this idea. He has this great idea. He's like, okay, I'm a brand new king. What am I gonna do? He's like, I believe we need to bring God back into the center of our nation again. And he's like, I'm gonna bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And as we read up to this chapter, it says that he goes and he captures Jerusalem. That's why it's called the city of David. He makes it his capital and his power continues to grow more and more each day. And this leads us to 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verses one through three, and it says this. David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is the will of our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our people throughout the territories of Israel, and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Listen to verse three. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. If you're reading along in the New Living Translation, verse three says it this way. It is time to bring back the ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. And that is the first thing I wanna pull from the, the story today, which is this, that if we want to see our nation revived again, like true revival happen in this nation, if you want personal revival to happen in your personal life, we have to recognize where we have failed to put God first. 
We have to get back to this. We have to recognize that where we have messed up, where we have missed the mark, where we have not put God first because David's in his first year of office, so to speak, and he goes, all right, I understand this is what um, Saul did. I understand this is how uh, Saul did things, but I wanna do things differently. Think about that word inquire. We didn't inquire of the Lord. That comes from the word inquiry, right? We didn't go and ask God the questions that we have. What did we, what did we do? We just went to Saul. We asked Saul, what are we supposed to do? And, and that was good when Saul was following the Lord. But if you know the story, eventually Saul rebelled and he led the people to rebel. And as you read uh, over Saul's kingship, the nation of Israel got to experience a measure of freedom. I'm talking about like this much. They would win two battles, they'd lose one. They think they got the freedom, they think they got the victory and all of a sudden something else would happen and they just could never really break the chains that were over them. And I think David saw that and he goes, this is what I've seen. Saul neglected to put God first. We're not gonna do this in my, and under my reign. We're gonna bring the ark of our God back to Jerusalem. And, and I love that in him. And as I was studying this uh, scripture, I couldn't help but think about the different ways that we failed to put God first in our own country, right? And, and I could honestly, we could spend this whole time here talking about different ways that we failed to put God first. But as I studied this, I really had just two two areas where I was like, you know what, I think those were, if I could pinpoint times in our nation's history where we've really missed it, these would be them. And the first one is when we removed prayer from our public school rooms. And this might become as a big surprise. This happened even before I was, I was born in the 80s. So this is, I, I don't remember this, but young people over here, I'll speak to you. Do you guys know there was once upon a time you could actually pray out loud in public schools? Not only that, your teachers could pray for you. They would pray before class even started. And that's not to bash public schools these days. It's not anything to do with that, right? It's just the reality is we can't do that now, but we used to be able to do it then. And I came across this article and I just found it so fascinating. And it said this, since prayer was removed from public classrooms in 1962, we've had a six fold increase in violent crime. Our divorce rate has tripled. Births to single mothers have increased fivefold. The teenage suicide rate has tripled and SAT scores have dropped 80 points. You might say, ah, oh, that's a coincidence. I say that's inputs and outputs, right? When you stop asking for the blessing of God over something, you stop receiving the blessing of God over something. And there's a, there was a time in our nation where we were every day coming before God, every teacher, every student. I mean, think about this and asking for the blessing of God over our country. And I think we really did receive it. David saw this, he saw the writing on the wall. He goes, I saw what David did. We neglected God. We, we didn't ask him those questions and we saw where it got us. We're gonna do something different. Could we have that type of boldness in our own family, with our own faith in this own country to say, hey, we've neglected to put God first in some ways, but no longer. The other thing that really stuck out to me as I was just thinking about our own nation, and I, like I said, I could pick out a million different examples, but was when Charles Darwin wrote his book, Origin of Species, in 18, uh, 1859. And I, I'm not trying to make a political statement or, or anything like that, but that book, and it wasn't even a theological book. It, it wasn't about Christianity or anything like that. But he introduced this idea of natural selection, which eventually became this idea of evolution, which essentially was, hey, if we're just random molecules, evolving into different animals and that animal evolved to another one and that one finally became maybe an ape-like creature and then uh, that one became a human, great. But then all of a sudden they were like, well, if that's true and that became a popular, popular belief in this nation, they made the decision, well, then why do we need God? Because up until that point, you could go up to anyone. You could literally go up to anyone in the world, but definitely in this nation who understood the concept of God as we know it. And we'd say, who created all of this, who created the universe, who created mankind, who created you? And even if they were not a professing Christian, they would go, well, God, God is the one, right? And when Charles Zorin wrote that book, it opened up this idea that maybe we don't need God to get all these decisions in life. And it really gave birth to this view of humanism. And humanism is just this idea that as humans, we get to decide what is right and wrong. We get to decide what is good and evil. We get to decide our own truth. And I'm just telling you, in our nation, that's just not... I mean, that just sounds normal to us now because that's how our nation thinks. But that wasn't normal back then. That was very contrary to what our nation thought and believed. 
And I was reminded of that this week, uh, my family and I were watching the movie National Treasure. And if you guys have ever seen it before, it's a fun little movie where they believe there's a treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence. And at one point they go up to it and they have to steal it in the movie. And the guy starts reading a little, a little bit from it. And I wanna read you guys the preamble here. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator, listen to this, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in the movie, he makes this comment and he goes, man, people don't talk like that anymore. And when I was watching it, I heard the Lord say, people don't talk like that anymore because they don't believe in that anymore. Think about that. We hold these truths to be self-evident. What truths? What is he talking about? That all men are created equal, created in the image of God, right? And eventually, I mean, that's just what was the standard. And then, gosh, what do we do when our standards, our foundation is being attacked? Psalm 11:3 says, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And, and there's, this time, there's this times when I'm watching uh, videos about what's going on in our country. And it's usually when Adrian and I are going to bed and we're laying next to each other. And she's like, oh, don't, that's gonna bother you. Don't watch those videos right now. I'm like, I can't because the foundations of our country are being destroyed and I almost feel helpless. I don't know what to do. Uh, I mean, I'll turn to God, I, I pray and all that. And I, I'm telling you, if you are in that boat right now, just put God first in your life. Put God first in your life. Psalm 119 verse 50 says this, this is my comfort in my affliction. And I have been afflicted by this. Like we, we, we live in this country, we all have that your word has revived me to life. And if we wanna see this nation change, we have to go back to the word of God. We have to go back to the supremacy of the word of God. We have to understand where we have failed to put God first and put God back on that pedestal or otherwise we're gonna make the same mistakes Saul did and have the same results. There has to be a turning over to the Lord, just like David did. So David has this great idea. I really do think this is an awesome idea. And uh, we can skip down to verse seven in First Chronicles chapter 13. And this is what it says next. They placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house. This is very important what they did here. Uzzah and Ahio were guarding the cart, David, uh, guiding the cart. David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all of their might, singing songs, playing all kinds of musical instruments, lyres, harps, tambourines, cymbals, trumpets. Come on, this was a party. People are excited. Like David's invited everyone. Can you imagine the pressure of being a new king, inviting all of your subjects to come to this moment? He's really excited. But look at, look at verse nine. But when they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the oxen stumbled. Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah and he struck him dead because he had laid his hand on the ark. So Uzzah died there in the presence of God. David was angry because the Lord's anger had burst out against Uzzah. And he named that place Perez Uzzah, which means to burst out against Uzzah, as it is still called today. Look at verse 12. David was now afraid of God. David was now afraid of God and he asked, how can I ever bring the ark of God back into my care? So David did not move the ark into the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom of Gath. And I'm, I'm gonna pause right there and I'll explain what all that meant, but I think it's time for you guys to know what it makes the Ark of the Covenant so important. What, what makes, what, what is so special about this Ark? Why does David wanna bring it back? And we'll talk about it more closer to the end of the service, but here's what you guys need to know right now. The Ark was this the religious sacred object. We talked about the sacred this morning in communion. It was the sacred object that was wholly set apart for one reason and one reason only. It was the physical place where God's uh, presence dwelt. And it was just this chest. It was a wooden chest overlaid with gold. But when God came down and met with Moses and Moses was the one commissioned to create the ark. And when God, after Moses created it, when God would come down and sit, he would sit right at the top of this chest. And that's where he would meet with God or meet with Moses face to face, right? When Moses died and Joshua took over and Joshua would go before the ark, that's where God's presence would fall down and he'd speak. And from that time on, every high priest that would meet with God once a year, God's presence would fall fall on this ark. But when Moses created it, God gave him very, very special instructions. I believe it's Exodus 25, verse 14. He says, 
When you move the ark, do it this way. When you build it, I want you to put these gold rings on the side. Then I want you to make these gold long poles and I want you to slide the poles through those rings and only the priests, only the Levites can pick up those poles and carry the ark wherever I tell them to go. He goes, this is important because I'm a holy God and this is where my presence is gonna dwell. And if anyone touches it, the reason why you have these poles to keep this distance, because anyone who touches this ark will die. He wasn't trying to hide anything from the Israelites. He wasn't trying to hide anything uh, from Moses or the people of God. And yet, what did we read that David did? At the very beginning, he says, they placed the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from Abinadab's house. Listen to me, okay? This is so, so, so important. If we wanna see this nation revived and revival truly to break out in this city, in this country, in our lives, we have to see a reverence for God restored. David lost his reverence for God. David knew the proper way to move this ark. The reason why I know this, because in the next chapter we're gonna read, he actually does it the right way. But he doesn't do it the right way and he, because he loses his reverence for God. He says, God, I understand this is the way you prescribe. This is your prescription on how to do something. But I think I have a better idea. <laughs> Can I just say, if we ever get to the point where we think the creator of the universe, that we have a better idea than him, a better way of doing something, we need to watch out, <laughs> right? Like we, we need to watch out a little bit. And listen, I believe David had great intentions. Like I love the fact that first year in office and he's like, let's do this. We're gonna bring the ark God of our God back. We're gonna celebrate. We're gonna do all this. He had the best intentions. But Thomas Edison even said, good intentions with a bad approach often leads to poor results. And this was a bad approach, church. I mean, very bad. It's like he was saying, man, I know this is how you do it, but I think I have a better idea. And listen, I don't think he was being malicious. I don't think he was being evil. He had good intentions, but I do believe David was being prideful. I believe that David was being prideful because he's saying, I know better. And I know I kind of poked fun at our culture a little bit, but we can look at our very own church walls, right? Like the Big C Church. I think we have an amazing pastoral staff here, Pastor Thomas, the elders. They lead us tremendously. And I promise you this, in this church, the message of the gospel will never change. That way, you're gonna hear it every single Sunday. Somehow, in some shape, some fashion, you're gonna hear that we're all sinners in need of a savior. That's the, and then Jesus has provided that saving grace. That's the good news, right? But listen, it, it, when we now, are, nowadays, even churches, the church in America, we've lost the reverence for God when we say, we know this is what the Bible says, but man, that whole thing about dying to yourself or calling that certain thing a sin, our culture doesn't call that a sin anymore. Our culture doesn't think this is bad anymore. So if we just change the gospel just a little bit, wouldn't this be better? Wouldn't we get more people to come to Jesus? And I'm telling you, that is such a bad approach. We need to see the reverence of God restored in this nation. But again, it starts with you you and it starts with me. Do we have reverence for God in our own life? Are we making the choices? Are we making the decisions to say, I am not just putting God first, but I'm understanding who he is because yes, I get it. He is our friend. He is our savior. He is our good father, but he is also God. I mean, he is God. He is the God of the universe. He created mankind from the dust of the earth, breathed his spirit inside of us. And that's how we live and move and have our being. Like we cannot forget who God is. We have to have that reverence restored. And I was reminded, um, I'm surprised that David lost this because if we look at David's life, I think, man, throughout it, he had unbelievable reverence for the Lord. If you know his story, he was anointed. He was supposed to be king. And when he had opportunities to king kill uh, king kill King Saul, he was like, man, I'm not gonna even touch the Lord's anointed. Like, if he wants me to be king, God will make me king. I'm not gonna do it. Why? Because he had a reverence for God. But he misses this, and, and the people of God had this high reverence, I mean, like, so high uh, that they would not even speak the name of God out loud. They had certain words for him, like Jehovah and all this, but when Moses uh, came to free them from slavery, he, uh, you know, you know the story, the burning bush, and he goes to God, and, or God comes to him, and he goes, well, who, who should I tell them sent me? And God says, tell them I am sent you, that Yahweh sent you. And then so Moses goes, and he goes, hey, this God Yahweh has sent me, and then he performs all these miracles, right? We all know all the plagues. And then can you imagine going up to a sea and the sea parting and then going into the wilderness and then food from heaven being just all over the ground, like true unbelievable miracles, right? And then at a point, they, 
come to God and God comes down to the people. And if you read the story, his presence is so powerful that God falls on this mountain and the mountain is covered in smoke, fire, lightning. It's like a scene from a movie, right? And uh, he goes, only Moses can come up and talk to me. If anyone touches this mountain, if anyone, even if an animal touches this mountain, they will have to die. Does it sound familiar? You're thinking, again, why? Why would God do this? Because we can't forget the the God that we serve, that he is a holy, righteous God, set apart from all other religions, set apart from all other gods. And we just miss this. I I, I get it. I, I think of God as my friend all the time. And as I pray and as I talk, that's who I'm talking to. I get it. But when I'm living my life and when I'm putting things into practice, I'm living it out like, man, God is watching me. God is leading me. God. And the Jewish, uh, Jews had such high reverence for God, they wouldn't even use the name Yahweh. They don't even, we don't actually don't even know if that's how you pronounce it because it was lost in translations for, translations. for thousands of years, they would just write it on a tablet and I'm sure they'd be like, you know, Jehovah, you know, the God of the universe. And they're like, you know, the God who did all this, like Yahweh. Like they wouldn't even whisper it because that's just how much reverence they had for God. And now we live in a culture that we're just like, oh, oh my God, oh God, this, this, this. And like, we just need to be careful. And I know that's like just an expression maybe, but I believe it's more than expression. Maybe that's something that you've learned growing up, but we have to have this reverence of God restored. We have to realize the God that we serve. We have to remember this. Now let's look at uh, verse 12 says this, so one of David's friends just dies. And in verse 12, it says, David was now afraid of God. And he asks, how can I ever bring the ark of God back into my care? Listen, we are always gonna be afraid of something if we don't understand it. Church, we can't afford not to understand who our God is, or otherwise we're always gonna be afraid of him in an unhealthy way. Because again, the amazing thing is we should think of God, El Shaddai, Yahweh, whatever you wanna call him, like he is all powerful, almighty, but the most amazing thing is is that he desires a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you. He is your friend. He is your savior. He is your good father. That should be the amazing part, right? Not that just that there is such a creator that created all of mankind, created the universe, that he wants to be our friend, that's amazing. So when we have reverence for God, that doesn't mean we just like, oh, I just, you know, I can't come close to God. Hebrews says, we draw close to God. We can boldly go into the throne room of our heavenly father, right? Because of what Jesus Christ did for us. That is the good news. But David was afraid of God and he doesn't bring the Ark of God, the, uh, the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And, uh, and for a whole chapter here, uh, we'll, we'll skip chapter 14, but basically I think David does a little bit of soul searching in this part of his life. He uh, doesn't really say that, but I think he begins to ask God these questions. He's like, man, God, I, you anointed me king. You finally put me in charge. You fulfilled your promises to me, but that was kind of embarrassing. I kind of just asked the entire nation to come help me do this. And now like one of my best friends died and I, can't, I had to leave the ark. I couldn't even bring it. Like, has anyone been a little embarrassed before when you've tried to do something for God and just kind of fallen on your face? You guys are all liars. I see no hands. I know all of you guys have done that. Okay, thank you. I've done that more times than I can count. Or I try to be bold for God and all of a sudden I'm just like, oh man, what am I doing, right? And sometimes it's just a step of faith and I just have to move on. Other times, you know, I, I, I go away with God and I say, God, what are you speaking to me? And he's like, Micah, good idea, bad approach. I'm like, okay, yeah, show me to do things the right way. Show me to do these things your way. God, let me have a reverence for you. If you tell me how to do something, I'm not gonna pretend like I have a better answer or a better way. And that's where we have to get to. So we'll skip chapter 14. It's a time of him praying and doing other things. But now we can get to chapter 15 because what he sees is, hey, the guy that we dropped this Ark of the Covenant with, his, his house is being blessed this whole time. And he goes, okay, I did have a good idea, but maybe I had a bad approach. Let's bring, let's try again. Let's bring it back. And if we read in chapter 15, verses one through three, it says this. David now built several different buildings for himself in the city of David. He also prepared a place for the ark of God and set up a special tent for it. Then he commanded, no one except the ark, I'm sorry, no one except the Levites may carry the ark of God. The Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and serve him forever. So David's learning from his mistakes, right? It's okay to make a mistake. It's okay. It's only detrimental when we don't learn from it. 
Verse three, then David summoned all Israel to Jerusalem. Gutsy move, David. He's inviting everyone back again to bring the ark of the Lord to the place he has prepared for it. But this is so important. I believe he does this because he, does, he wants the entire nation to experience the blessing of God. He wants the entire nation to to experience this joyful time. And even if some of them were like, well, I kind of liked the days of Saul. I kind of like this. Can we just say we want to invite people into something better? This is not just for us. We want to invite our culture. We want to invite this nation, this world into something better. And so did David. And if we skip down to verse 12, this is what it says. He said to them, you are the leaders of the Levite families. You must purify yourself. So I want you to circle that word purify and all your fellow Levites so you can bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. Because you Levites did not carry the ark the first time, the anger of the Lord our God burst out against us. We failed to ask God how to move it properly. So the priests and the Levites purified themselves. Circle that word again, purified. The priests and the Levites purified themselves in order to bring the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel to Jerusalem. And this is your homework for the rest of the day. I want you to go and read what happens next. But I'll give you a little precursor to it unbelievable revival happens in the nation of Israel. David, uh, he's like, okay, here we go again. Everyone's watching. He sacrifices. They take a few steps and he realizes, okay, God is with us this time. We're doing things the right way. They're carrying them on the poles. They're doing all that. And they celebrate. And this is a huge, huge party. By the time they get back to Jerusalem, David is dancing. I'm talking about he is celebrating. He is really dancing. I mean, Michael Jackson got nothing on David at this moment, okay? He could show him up. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever danced like David danced before and because he was just so excited he was like I don't even know how to show how excited I am that we're finally bringing the ark of the covenant back into our care because we rejected it during the reign of Saul and I know what this means for my people I know what this means for my people and he goes and starts sacrificing all these amazing gifts to the Lord and at the end, he gives a gift to every single person who's come to uh, celebrate with him and sends them out with a blessing. And that church, listen, from that moment on, I truly believe that God's blessing fell on the nation of Israel like it had never had it before. And if we read, you know, where I said under Saul's reign, under their way of doing things, under their approach, they experienced a measure of freedom. They won one battle, they lost the next. They had one victory and then they were two steps back, Right. From this point on, David started defeating every enemy of Israel. No one could stand against him. He had so much power and authority that even nations that he didn't have to go and fight started paying him tribute. They're like, we, we just heard of how great you are, how powerful the God that you serve is. Just take it. You don't even have to defeat us. We'll just send you this money. He's like, man, free money, easy money, right? Like, I'll take it. And, and So not only did they experience spiritual reformation in that country because they put God first and they decided to have reverence for the Lord, they also got to experience economic freedom in their nation as well. And if we read, uh, his son eventually takes over after David's death and uh, his son Solomon asks for wisdom and God grants it to him. And then because of that, he also blesses Solomon and the country with so much riches that that gold is so common, uh, so readily available that it says silver was like commonplace. It it hardly had any value during Solomon's day because the people of God were living under the blessing of God. An unbelievable time. Historians call this the golden age of Israel. But I wanted you guys to catch this, okay? What was the last thing that David told the priests and the Levites to do? purify themselves. He has to purify themselves. And that's the last thing I want to pull from this story, which is this. If we want to see this nation restored, if we want to see revival break out in this nation, if you want to see revival break out in your personal life, we must be willing to purify or set ourselves apart for the Lord. We have to be willing to do that. Listen, he says, priests and Levites, they purified themselves in order to bring the ark of the Lord back to Jerusalem. And like I said, your version might say purified, it might say sanctified. It's the same root Hebrew word, Kadesh. Kadesh means to be consecrated, to be dedicated, to be observed as holy, to keep sacred. It's to honor the sacred, but probably the most important part of the definition of this word is to be set apart. 
And the only way I can describe this to you guys is imagine if I had 10 cups here and maybe they even all look the same, but I place one cup and I set it off to the side and I say, what's different about these cups? And you go, well, not much, but that one's set apart from the other ones. And they go, that's it. The world needs to see us. And I don't know why I keep looking over here, but because maybe I just feel for you guys. I understand you young people who like live in just a culture that you've never experienced maybe the blessing of God, what it was like to have all your teachers pray for you or to have the people like lift you up or have a coach pray for you. But I'm telling you, when we live set apart, people should be able to see you guys walking down the halls of your school and say, something's different about that student. Something's different about that man. Something's different about that marriage. Something's different about that family because you're living set apart lives from this world. And listen, that does not mean that we're self-righteous, that we're somehow more holy, more special, more uh, powerful than other people. It has nothing to do with that. That's legalism and that's you trying to get your own way and grace and thinking that you're better than other people. We're not better than people because this is how I know it, right? Back in the biblical times, for them to be holy, for those priests to literally have the capability of carrying that ark, they would have had to go and kill an animal, sprinkle its blood over themselves because the Bible says there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And so they would have had to do that. Thank God we live under a better covenant where it says Jesus Christ was the supreme sacrifice of all time so that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, immediately we live set apart. Immediately that sets us apart from the world. But here's the question for you guys. Are you living set apart lives? Am I living? It's a question that my wife and I ask all the times in our marriage, my personal walk, how we, how we raise our kids. Can people see a difference in my life? Can people see a difference in the way I love my kids or the way I lead them or, or my family, whatever the case may be, than how other people in the world do? I'm not saying we're any better than the world, but we should be different than the world. Are you different enough from your culture to make a difference in your culture right now? Are you different enough from this world to make a difference in this world? Because if you just try to blend in, no one's gonna know the difference. You're not gonna stand out. They're gonna be like, why would I need to make a commitment to follow Jesus And if we've had the exact same lives? Why would I need to do this? Because God's called us to live separate holy lives. Not that we're better than, not that we're different than, we're just separate. We're set apart, not by our own work, but only by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'll invite the worship team to come out, but you know, I said I'd explain more about the Ark of the Covenant because this is so important. The Ark plays a central role in this entire story, and it's important that we really understand. Like I said, it was just a, a chest. It was just a chest that they created, covered it in gold, and, but there was four parts to it, four parts, and there was three things inside the chest. First was Aaron's staff. Aaron's staff just represents God's authority, right? A staff uh, brings correction, and it's the one that budded and produced almonds. It was a sign that Aaron was a spiritual leader of the people of Israel, and they had to follow him. And they placed, once Aaron died, they placed that staff in the ark. Another object that was in the ark was these jars of manna, and manna was the food that God provided for the Israelites as they wandered the wilderness. This represents God's provision, miraculous, unbelievable. For 40 years, they, did, they, weren't, they didn't grow hungry because they had this provision over their lives. So they put that in the, the ark. And then finally, we had the stone tablets, the physical stone tablets that God wrote on and gave Moses the 10 commandments, right? Now, the New Testament tells us the law, which is what the tablets represent, the law only serves one purpose. It's, it points out our sin. Without the law, we wouldn't know what sin was, right? We just go on living the same life, but we need to know, hey, murder is wrong. Lying and cheating, stealing is wrong because that's what the law does. It shows us those things. But there was a fourth, fourth piece to this uh, covenant, this chest. And the very top, it was this chest that was overlaid with gold and they had these angels facing each other and they had their wings stretched out. And where those wings touched was the physical place where God would lay his presence. And that place was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. So I want you guys to think about this. We have uh, this object that represents God's authority, his corrective nature to say, hey, you're missing the mark. Get back into place here, Micah. Gotcha, thank you. We have something that represents God's provision in our life. He wants to provide things for you. He wants to provide things for this nation. And then in that same chest 
was God's law, things that point out where we have missed the mark. But over all of that is God's mercy. His mercy covers his law. His mercy covers his corrective authority. He even covers his provision. And that's not just something he wants to get to you. He wants to get inside of you. He wants to change you from the inside out. And he covers that with mercy because he understands we are going to make mistakes. He knew that. He knew Israel was going to make a mistake and, and, and he knew that they weren't gonna keep up with this covenant and that's why he sent Jesus. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for you, for me, because he realized no one was gonna live a perfect spotless life, no one except for Jesus. Now by his blood, by his stripes, you and I are healed. And we can experience the same type of freedom Israel experienced if we have this reverence for God. If we put him back in the place where he calls us to and live a life that's separate and holy and devoted to him. Can I have you guys stand to your feet? You might be thinking, so why? But like, I, Pastor Micah, I still don't get it. Why do I have to live this holy separate life? Like if the blood of Jesus cleanses me, isn't that good enough? Well, the grace of God is nothing to spit upon, but first Peter tells us that uh, God is holy, so we must be holy. First Peter 1 Peter 1.16 says, you must be holy because I am holy. Remember, we're still serving the same God, the same God, the creator of the universe. This is the wildest thing. Think about this. At one point under David's time and rule, he only knew one thing, that God's physical presence lived in one place. From that time on until uh, Jesus came, that's where God's presence dwelt, in the temple and on that mercy seat. But when Jesus died, that veil in the temple was torn. And this is what 1 Corinthians 3, 16 tells us. Do you not know that now you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? You're saying, why do we have to be holy? Why do we have to live set apart lives? Because God lives in you. God lives in you. That same righteous, holy, all-powerful God lives in you. He is different than any other God in the entire world. He is the most powerful, uh, 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 unbelievable, awesome, mighty God. And the crazy thing is, we get to be his temple now if we get to accept him as our Lord and Savior. That is why, that is why we have the privilege of getting to share in his blessing. And that's how I believe in faith that revival really can happen in your life. And through us, I believe revival can happen in this nation again, amen, amen. So just bow your hearts. I wanna pray for you guys. And I just ask right now, would you ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, what are you speaking to me? What areas of your life have you failed to put God first? What areas of your life are you trying to manipulate just enough? Like, God, I have good intentions. I'm doing this, but I think I have a better plan. And God's just saying, stop it. Stop it. We know this approach is going to lead to death. It's never going to lead to freedom. Do what I prescribed and watch the blessings that I have for you overflow. Just like that testimony we heard in, uh, from Marsha today during the offering. She goes, man, I've struggled with this, but when I stopped doing it my own way, started doing God's way, well, look at the blessing that poured out. And I, someone in here needs to know this right now. You've struggled with freedom. You've struggled to break those chains of addictions. You've done that because you've been trying to do it your own way. Can I just tell you, God's way is so much better. It's the message of the good news, but he does call us to put him first. He does call us to have a reverence for the Lord in it. He does call us to live sacred, set apart lives. So if you wanna receive this, I just pray you turn your heart to the Lord one more time. Let me pray a blessing over you. If you wanna stick out your hands, just receive this prayer. Lord, I pray for every man, woman, or child who's dealing with this, who's struggling to put you first who might be struggling to honor you with the way they talk, honor you with the way they live. God, I pray that you would bless them. You would keep them. Your face would shine upon them and you would give them the strength and courage to live holy, set apart lives. Again, not by their own strength, God, but by you. I pray that as we meet together in this church, in this building, because we are the church, God, but I pray we would never grow commonplace with us meeting together. I pray every time that we meet, we would come with an expectation that you are about to move, with an expectation that even as we're about to worship, that we are worshiping the God of the universe. And we're singing more than songs. We're saying more than just words. We're encountering the God of the universe. 
May our reverence for you be restored, God. And as we talk about what you have done in our lives, that we'd have so much reverence and so much respect that we'd say, man, God, God healed me in this. God healed my cancer. God healed my family. God healed my marriage. He restored the relationship that was broken with my son or my daughter. God did this. Father, I pray that we would have that type of passion in our own lives and in this nation again. Revive us to life and anew and bless us in Jesus' name, amen. And finally, before we close, I just wanna give anyone in here an opportunity to experience the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And today, I really wanna take a moment. I just want you to search your hearts one more time again. I know there's a lot of people in here. I know there's a lot of people watching online, but do not miss this moment. This moment is for you. I believe God led me to James 4, 8, which says this, come close to God, draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. And we love that verse, it's an amazing promise, but we sometimes fail to read the second part of it. It says, wash your hands, you sinners, purify or set apart your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And today I believe someone's in here and you're hearing this message and you're saying, for a long time, my loyalty has been with God and it's been with people. I've been living this double life, this blended life where I'm like, I might call myself a Christian, but I still like the things of the world and I'm not living this holy set apart life. Listen, this is done not by your own strength. This is only by coming to the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ. Only by him can we do this. But I'm telling you, the message of the gospel, the good news says it doesn't matter what you did today, doesn't matter what you did last week, doesn't matter what you did right before you walked into the sanctuary, God desires a relationship with you right now. And you can lay your burdens, you can lay your sins on the cross, and immediately there's forgiveness. Immediately there's restorations. It happens right here, right now. So if there's anyone in here who wants to give your life to Jesus Christ, would you just raise your hand boldly? No one's looking, no one cares, but we're, we're saying, uh, I care, actually, I care. I'm saying I, God cares. He wants to see your life restored in Jesus' name, through Jesus' blood. And I see hands, come on, don't, don't shy. We have a few more minutes here. Just anyone else, don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity if you're watching online. Pull over from your car, stop. If you're, uh, if you're alone in a dorm, whatever you're doing, just stop and say, God, I surrender. I am done living this with a loyalty divided between you and the world. Today, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing to live set apart. Amen. You can lower your hands and now we're just gonna pray this prayer together. And I want everyone to pray it together. Repeat after me. But the reason we do this is because uh, we wanna show our brothers and sisters who raise their hands today, we support them. We love them. But it also reminds you and me that no matter how long we've been a Christian, no matter how many uh, sermons we've heard, how many times we've come to church, we'll never graduate from grace. We need to be reminded of these truths and these facts. Amen. So just repeat after me. Say, Father, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could never pay, to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start. I give you my life and I give you my trust. And because of the blood of Jesus, I will never be the same. Come on, let's give God praise one more time. Thank you, Jesus. He's doing something in this place. He's doing something in our nation and he's doing something in your life. Let's worship one more time. Guys, thank you so much. We love you. Let's worship.